This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Um, I realize it's always hard to squeeze these in when you're busy, but thank you. I am going to share my screen. Bear with me a half second here. I hope everybody can see that. So welcome to today's webinar on air management in rinks and recreation spaces. Okay, it's another one in our industry builder learning series. So again, thank you for taking the time to attend today. We had 22 people registered. It doesn't look like we have all 22 participating now, but I'll talk more about the recording um, when I get there. I would just like to quickly recognize that we are all treaty people and the program services and support offered by Saskatchewan Parks and Recreation covers treaties two, four, five, six, eight, and 10. And we respect and honor the treaties and we move forward with Indigenous nations in the spirit of truth, reconciliation, and collaboration. Saskatchewan Parks and Recreation, also known as SPRA, provides leadership support and services that contribute to recreation's impact on the quality of life for people in Saskatchewan. We have our main office in Regina and we had field offices throughout the province. Learn more about SPRA at spra.ska.ca. I would like to quickly note too that our organization is empowered through the funding we receive from SASC Lotteries. We manage the recreation section of those SASC Lotteries Trust for Sports, Culture and Recreation. I would like to recognize Chris Chappelle is on the call today as well from SPRA. He's in the background helping uh, put on today's webinar. My name is Tim Hanna. I am the consultant for facilities and training with SPRA. So thanks again for joining us today. During our session today, be as engaged as possible. Okay, you can mute yourself if you have a question. Okay, please make sure you're unmuted otherwise. Don't be afraid to turn on your camera. It's always nice to look at people's faces and see the shock and awe that we inspire during our webinars. Okay, you can also change the view that you're looking at as well. And there's a list of participants. Okay, so don't be afraid to reach out to them and chat as well. Today's session is being recorded and all of you will receive a link to that recording once it's um, produced. Okay, there will be a follow-up email that goes out today as well or possibly tomorrow. Okay. When you receive that follow-up email, there's a survey, a very short survey of four or five questions. If you can take a minute or two to complete the survey, we really nope. do appreciate that feedback. Okay, we'd like to know how you, what was your experience? <clears throat> so today, again, don't be afraid to take the opportunity to find out more about what we're talking about. Okay, don't be afraid to ask questions. Okay, if we don't have enough time to cover off everybody's questions today, we'll gather those questions and with Scott's assistance, we'll provide answers to everybody. Okay, I won't read this, but this is what we're trying to get across today is the importance of ventilation and air quality in recreation spaces and places. Okay, since the start of COVID, there's been a bit of a shift in how it's transmitted. And personally, I think there's going to be funding coming down at some point to help facilities like arenas and other community centers deal with, I'll say, poor ventilation systems. So we're going to talk a lot about that today and talk about what options you may have with either existing systems or if you have very little in the way of ventilation system in your facilities. And those are some of the learning out outcomes that we hope to cover as well. I'm so pleased to partner with Simcoe Refrigeration to put on this webinar today. And what I would like to do is turn the presentation over to Scott Johnson from Simcoe Refrigeration. He's the branch manager located in Saskatoon. So I'll stop sharing my screen now. And I'm gonna send it over to you, Scott. Thank you very much, I appreciate that.
Now I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. And and Tim, did you uh, did you actually give me authority to share? I will just double check that real quick, Scott. Bear with me. Got to find you here. Okay, now you have presenter privileges. There we go. That should uh, should pop up for everybody to see. Yeah, I can see uh, your presentation. Excellent. I'd like to uh, like to thank Tim and the S SPRA uh, for the opportunity this morning to uh, to speak to you. I know everybody's going to be well familiar with uh, with Simcoe Refrigeration as the experts uh, in your ice plants and, and your facilities and keeping things cold and keeping things operating. And there's probably a bit of a question mark around why we would be qualified or why would we be coming in to speak to you around indoor air management guidelines. Uh, I was very, very fortunate this year and lucky to be uh, offered an opportunity to, to join Simcoe. And prior to coming to Simco, I spent 10 years working in the indoor air quality uh, industry. Uh, I had had a portfolio of, of well over 1,500 accounts in Saskatchewan. And I've been in facilities, I, I've been in towns and cities and communities uh, everywhere from Frontier to, to La Loche to Hudson Bay to Yorkton and Oxbow and Carlisle and, and, and throughout the province. And I guess the thing about that is that it really does realize, uh, allow me to realize what it is that uh, you face in the way of challenges of, of uh, aged infrastructure, uh, older designs, uh, what your buildings may or may not on, encompass, uh, financial challenges and all those different sorts of things. So I have a really great background. I'm not a mechanical engineer, I'm not an engineer but I was often one of the people that the engineering firms or engineering companies came to to assist with uh, with answers and guidance and specifications as, as they face challenges and, uh, and tasks ahead of them. So that's a very bit of a brief bio about me and where I come from and, and why we feel Simcoe is, is well positioned to uh, present today and to speak to this. And like everything, I, I feel in life you should have a goal. And we had a very clear set goal for today's presentation. And that's very simply to provide knowledge and guidance. And it's really about eliciting future questions and conversation. This is a very detailed, complex topic. We have a short amount of time to discuss it. And the reality is we'll scratch the surface and there's gonna be a lot more in the way of questions and conversation to come after today. With most things in today's world, we always like to start to talk and speak about things with a safety moment. And for your consideration, I'm just showing you two clear glasses of water, and I'm asking you if you can see the difference just by looking at them visually. The glass on the right, or my right, represents what we see as dirty air. And the glass on the left simply presents what we see as clean air. And I stress this point because the reality is we cannot see the difference visually between dirty air or clean air, and we're dealing with something that's below the optic threshold, which makes it a little bit of a challenge, a little bit difficult to deal with, and it, it's, it's a bit of a something to wrap your head around. So from the aspect of filtration, we can't see what we're trying to tackle. And what happens when you get a long-term exposure to dirty air, when things haven't been filtered properly or things haven't been dealt with properly, is a coil that may look like this. And this is a picture I took, you'll see in 2013. And I will tell you that it is a fairly well-known, well-respected restaurant in Saskatchewan. And what you're seeing in there is not only the coil and dust and dirt, but you're seeing a cumulative effect of a little bit of black mold, uh, white mold, and different sorts of things growing in it. And this is what happens over time with dirty air. You can't see it, but it begins to build.
And this really shows the importance of having a hazard assessment and working in your air handlers with the correct PPE because you really do want to protect yourself from these things. And I always enjoy starting my presentations with what I like to call a perception check. So if I was to say the color blue, I would ask everybody here to jot down or write down one of the first things that comes to your mind when you think of blue and just make a note. We do have an agenda. We do have some topics of discussion today. We'll definitely talk about ASHRAE positioning and recommendations. We're going to talk about the importance of indoor air quality. A bit about filtration efficiency. Some of the sterilizing options that are on the market nowadays. Understanding your system, having a look at it, inspecting it, assessing it and the importance of a maintenance and PM program. And today's conversation really is about indoor air quality. And that starts with an incredibly bold statement that nobody ever thinks about, but that is the reality of what it is. Air is the one commodity, it's the one thing in life that's vital to everybody's survival. None of us on this call will live more than four minutes without it and some of us far less. So when you're dealing with indoor air quality, the goal is to make the next four minutes of your life as comfortable as possible, perhaps the next four months, four years, or 14 years of your life as comfortable as possible. COVID has brought indoor air quality to the forefront and people are now starting to focus on it as being as important as what it is and really taking a look at what's going on. The misnomer that we have out there is that we bring fresh air into our facilities every day. And fresh air really is outside air. And, and with, with the bringing in of outside air, we're bringing in all the impurities that are associated with it. It could be pesticides from somebody spraying a field. It could be forest fire smoke, which we're all dealing with right now. It could be the exhaust air of the building right next door to you. It could be a, a number of assorted things. And the reality is what we're bringing into the building, we can't see. And just because we're bringing in a supposed clean air supply doesn't mean that we have a clean air environment. The most harmful particles to human health are below the optic threshold. They're referred to as PM 2.5, so they're under 2.5 microns in size. And they're produced primarily by what's going on in your environment and what's going on in your indoor space. And people are one of the biggest contributors to indoor air pollutants or indoor air particulate. And I always get such a kick out of this slide. You've got pig pen on the left and you've got somebody who's just had an allergic reaction or sneeze on the right. And every one of us on this call generate 100,000 sub-microscopic particles per minute just by sitting, not even talking, just by sitting. If we get up and simply walk across the room, perhaps glide across the ice, throw a curling rock, that accelerates to five million particles per minute, all with under the optical threshold. And some of the contaminant sources that we would see on a regular basis in facilities in Saskatchewan would be asbestos. Our biological pollutants would come from us. They could come from rodents. They could come from insects, carbon monoxide, grills in your kitchens, formaldehyde, which comes from pressed wood products, lead, nitrogen dioxide, and yes, even refrigerants, particularly the synthetic refrigerants. So we always go then to acceptable indoor air quality. And ASHRAE being ASHRAE has a standard. They have a very detailed definition of acceptable indoor air quality. They like to use big words. And I just basically translate it down to every individual facility and each person 
on this call representing a facility is going to have a different definition of what is acceptable indoor air quality in their facility. While ASHRAE may have a standard, we all have a paradox or reality that we live to every day in terms of what we define as acceptable indoor air. And this whole thing has been brought out by, you know, and the, and the conversation has really been sparked because of COVID. And ASHRAE, as time has gone by, have really made a paradigm shift in their speech. They've really made a tweak to their statement. It's a small step. And that is that we're now dealing with something that's airborne. And I'm not going to read through this. You guys all have the presentation. Uh, there is a hyperlink in the presentation, which will take you directly to the ASHRAE page on the COVID-19 response. But the reality is, is there's a high risk of transmission, airborne. And it's important that we're dealing with our HVAC systems uh, in such a way that we can minimize or mitigate the risk as best as possible. You know, and there's some good recommendations for reducing the airborne infectious spread of COVID or dealing with COVID and not only COVID, there's other things out there. There's bacteria, there's other viruses. Uh, there, there's all sorts of things that we deal with on a daily basis. But, you know, first and foremost, let's take a look at what the public health guidelines are. Are there statutory regulatory uh, requirements that we need to hit or recommendations? And I think the big one around COVID is you're not going to be able to run right out and do a bunch of research and see, reg see research and see regulations and, and statutory requirements. What you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of wording around recommendations. So understanding as, as different people may come back to you and press you for answers and, and understand as different people come back to you and press you to make changes, make financial commitments, uh, paradigm shifts in the way that you do business or operate now that that's driven by recommendations. And it's always worth going back and reading that statement because that does give you a better understanding. And that's a conversation that we can definitely take offline and, and we can chat about it at a further point in time or you can reach out to me after the fact. You know, you always look at outdoor air. Uh, the big acronym, I guess, in the industry I came from is the solution to pollution is dilution. So the more outdoor air we can bring in, the better. And the large ASHRAE recommendation on filters and air cleaners is that we want to hit a MERV 13 or better level of performance. And a lot of folks out here don't understand MERV. MERV's new to them. They maybe have heard it bandied about. MERV 13 is essentially just under where we would see a hospital a hospital would be a MERV 14 or 15 in their ICU. And what you can't achieve through ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning, air cleaners may very well be a viable option. And we always promote the mixing of airspace. So then it boils down to your HVAC system. How do you operate it? Well, you have guidelines and parameters around temperature and humidity set points. Balance your system between clean air and supply air. Operate your systems for a time required to flush out your space, three air changes. For a lot of facilities, they will go in, they'll turn the HVAC system on when they open the doors and they'll turn them off when they leave at the end of the day. This may mean you're going to have to have longer run times. In some cases, you may need to run 24-7. So there's a cost, there's a challenge. And we really do want to control contaminated air or the reentry of contaminated air. And this is about return air systems. So this is facilities that have return air systems or mixed air. And that's what it really comes down to in COVID-19 and your HVAC systems is a lot of the conversations are about and around return air. So you need to have some good fundamental understanding and knowledge of what your systems do, how they operate and what they're designed for. And there's some great guidance for reopening buildings. ASHRAE's got all sorts of things out there and you could read, you can research, you can spend hours at it. 
But one of the things that you may really want to consider is to reach out to somebody who's qualified. Have a conversation with them. You may need a little bit more additional analysis, a little bit of support. Has your system ever been looked at or evaluated? Have you ever had somebody come in or do you have somebody of knowledge on staff that can really look at your equipment, your systems, your controls, uh, look at them for performance and, and issues, uh, look at your ventilation, take a look at your filtration, what have you got, what's in use, how's it working? Do you have a good mix of outdoor and indoor air? Oftentimes facilities that primarily operate in the winter will minimize the entry of outdoor air because they are trying to save on the cost of heating. So you may have to step back and look at how your system's running and make some changes. Again, just by doing that, you will incur extra costs throughout the winter months because you're dealing with increased heating costs. Take a look at your filters. Are they MERV 13 or the highest achievable to meet the recommendation? And what are the combined effects of your outdoor air and filtration and air cleaners? Can we hit MERV 13? Can we make it higher? What are your needs? What are your wants? So I bring up a game on filtration efficiency the filters to be MERV 13 or better because this is a very clear ASHRAE recommendation. This has been right from day one of COVID and it continues to exist to today. To try and achieve a MERV 13 or better or the highest possible standard in recirculate, recirculated air systems where you can do so. And MERV is just simply the minimum efficiency reporting value. And I think for a lot of the facilities on the call today, particularly the small town facilities, depending what you have in play in your buildings, you're, you're likely running a MERV 8 filter. In some cases, you're just using simply baseboard heat, electric heat, uh, perhaps uh, a natural gas heater up in the corner of your room. So to talk about MERV rating or to talk about a filter in some cases is really a misnomer. It just makes no sense because you don't have that in there. For those of you that have a slightly more complex system, which may be a multiplex or a communiplex or a, a, a multi-use facility in a town, you can't go and add two or three or four banks of filters together and say, this is eight, this is eight, this is eight, good, we've got 24, we're ready to go. The MERV rating is based on the most efficient filter in your system, not the cumulative effect of all your filters. And one of the things that I found in my past life and one of the things that I found that is completely 100% true as we uh, went into COVID, is filters are typically selected by who's got the cheapest, who's got the lowest price. And decisions are made on the lowest input. Now, coming from the industry, obviously, I may have biases, I may have thoughts and feelings about one company versus another and that's not what the platform today is about i can certainly talk to you offline if you want to have that conversation but remember that not all filters are created equal you may have four filters that are merv8 there's distinct difference from one to the other one may be a mechanical media that's engineered to perform at a standard and only get better another one may be something that's enhanced enhanced with the stat static electricity uh, charge and it attracts dust and dirt and particulate to it just by an electrical charge and that filter typically may drop from a MERV-8 to a MERV-5 and has to get dirty to perform better so that would sift but to somebody who's making a purchasing decision that's inherently less money to start with and that's a very attractive decision However, it may not be the best decision in terms of what you're trying to do or what you're trying to prevent in your facility. One filter may hold the capacity of a half a pail of dust. The next MERV-8 filter may have the capacity to hold three pails of dust. A filter can really have a significant impact on energy costs. Depending what you select, you may change it two times a year, you may change it six times a year. 
And the reality is you really do get what you pay for. And no, I'm sorry to everybody on this call. I can't just put a hat in there. That, that just doesn't work. So some baseline facts and stats. Filters are a controlled leak. Each one of you is individual building operators, facility operators, directors, uh, whatever your role is. By filter selection, you're making a conscious decision on how you want to control the leak. So select accordingly and ensure that they're being installed correctly. Filters have a rating. And the rate rating is a resistance to airflow, and that costs you energy. Think of that as the gas mileage of your filter. And your selection really allows you to pick your fuel mileage. And the dirtier a filter gets, the more it costs you to run. So there's conversations that can be had around that. If you want to make a minor, inexpensive change to a lot of your facilities, it may be as simple as going to a 4-inch deep versus a 1-inch deep filter has four times the amount of media, much longer life, and you can really capture some energy and labor savings because I know none of the people that work in your buildings work for free, so you do have to pay them. Look for performance ratings. If you don't have them, ask your suppliers for them. Get an explanation, learn how to understand them. And to each of the people on the call today, where you have HVAC systems in play, there are design lim limitations in place. Do you know what they are? Can you work with them? You can utilize something called a magnahelic gauge on perhaps one of your most in-demand air handlers, and that will directly translate to a performance data chart and that will spark change out. That will instigate the need for you to address it. Some of the more complex facilities, the larger facilities, will have something called a BMS or a building monitoring system. And you can definitely use that as well to determine filter life and change out. Last but not least, safety. Treat your systems, particularly your return air systems, as a hazardous space. Remember the particulate is very small, it's easily disturbed, and the reality is there's a number of molds, there's a number of bacteria, there's a number of viruses that if you go into your air handler today and turn it off and change your air filters in three weeks, those things are still very much alive, they're still very much viable, and they're still very much a danger to your health. For those of you that have return air systems, if you've ever changed the filters, you'll notice that your dust load is typically creamy or a light gray or a milky color. A lot of that comes from people. That's dead skin cells. That's all that yuck that we give off just by living. So think about breathing that in. Think about safety and look after yourselves and look after your people. And this very simply shows a magnahelic gauge versus a performance chart. For those of you that use Simcoe for service, talk to us. We can assist and help supply and install these gauges. Then we get into some of the other things that are really buzzwords right now, some of the other topics that are, are, are very much in the media and out there. And the first is ultraviolet. UVC. And ASHRAE has got an absolute ton of information and documentation on the effectiveness of UV lights. They have a technical committee. UV works. It inactivates viral, bacterial, and fungal organisms. It actually prevents them from being able to reproduce. It doesn't kill them it basically neuters them. And it's a proven technology, it's got a lengthy history, and it's well used in many, many different industries, uh, from healthcare to food preparation to treating cabin air in some airlines, um, transportation, things like that. 
But the thing to remember about UVC is it needs to be used in conjunction with filtration and it becomes an extra line of defense. And what we've included in there for you are three really good hyperlinks around UVC that you can go and read at your leisure. There's a lot of different UVC out there. Some of the types of disinfections systems, I think that, you know, if I look and I think about some of the facilities and types of facilities that I see in Saskatchewan that would be very effective would be induct. So for those that have systems with uh, perhaps a little bit newer, more complex, you could essentially look at putting the UVC right in your air ducts. Again, couple it with mechanical filtration. In a case like this, you'd want to have a minimum MERV-8 filter in play as well for dust control. However, if you can go to a higher efficiency, it's certainly a recommendation. And it works very well. For those of you with rooms and spaces where you're maybe working with a little bit of baseboard heat or electric heat, you could look at upper air disinfection. And I've put a slide in there that just gives you a bit of an idea of what it looks like. And those are fixtures that are just up to ceiling height. And that's when you don't have mechanical vent ventilation or you have limited mechanical vent ventilation. Um, congregate settings, high risk areas, dressing rooms. I mean, those things come to mind. And, you know, it, it could be very expensive to try and put mechanical ventilation into some of the spaces and into some of your facilities. However, UV is something that you could put in there, turn on, leave running. You can have a fan in the corner so you're doing some air changes and getting some circulation in there. For some of you, this may be something that just makes really good sense. And again, this is a conversation you certainly feel free to have with me after the fact today. Uh, we have the ability to work with you and assist on these things. So for those of you with really large multiplexes or some of you on the other end of the spectrum where you may have uh, a system that does heating and venting, uh, heating and ventilation like your, your cooling, uh, your heating of spaces, meeting rooms, things like that, you, you've got a complex system, you can actually use UVC right on your coils. And not only are they going to be effective against COVID and uh, bacteria and virus and molds and Legionella and all sorts of other great things. Uh, UV on coils can actually, is one of the most effective ways of cleaning your coil. And you can actually look at a potential payback of 18 months to two years on your investment for UV if you're using it to treat in this type of system. It's The technology is very sound. There, there's a lot of studies out there. And again, I've put a hyperlink in there for, for some more uh, reading and research for those of you that are interested. And I encourage you to just follow along and have a look at that if you'd like. The other thing that a lot of us in Saskatchewan are really familiar with is where we see our tax dollars at work right now. And this is with the school boards and bipolar ionization. It seems like the majority of the school boards have gone down the road of bipolar ionization. Uh, I know the provincial government's put this in a number of its facilities or invest, investigated putting it in a number of the facilities. And I think with bipolar ionization, I just, all I can do is guide each and every one of you that if you're considering this, to step back and really assess it carefully and have a very careful look at it. I think the very first line there, ASHRAE does not currently have a society position on both bipolar ionization speaks volumes. There's very little, if any, third party documentation available. It is primarily industry driven. There is a very recent class action lawsuit in play in the United States around some of the claims to fame with bipolar ionization. And I'm not going to read the comment from the Center of Disease Control. But I think that it is a very, very important statement. They are urging each and every one of you to exercise caution and do your homework. 
research this technology if you're considering it. So for any of you which may have gone down this road or considering going down this road, I would just urge you to step back and have a very, very good look at it again. What I think may be of, of great use to a lot of facilities potentially in Saskatchewan are portable air cleaners. And, and these are installed in spaces or rooms, not in your HVAC systems. And they are so many different names in the market. And, and there's all kinds of types and there's all kinds of sizes. From the tabletop you can buy at your local hardware store to a large wheeled permanent one uh, in a room, a wheeled one that can go to another room. And you can get all sorts of different efficiencies of media in them up to and including HEPA. Some have ultraviolet light. Others may have a carbon-based filter in them for odor. So if I think of uh, a small dressing room and 30 kids with stinky hockey equipment, you can throw a good-sized room cleaner in there and you can start to get rid of that bad onion smell and you can get rid of some of the things that are being breathed into the room. You can do a lot with these portable air cleaners. And they're great when HVAC equipment may be non-existent or minimal and you can't meet an ASHRAE recommendation for ventilation and filtration. And I found uh, the most recent published information from ASHRAE on in-room air cleaner guidance, and it's a good reference for everybody here if they wanna go back and do a little bit more reading or a little bit more research on it. Then we get into inspection, audit, and assessment. This is what's going on in your building. This is what's going on in your system. You can start by looking at your ductwork. And that's best performed by somebody who's trained in the industry, an HVAC professional or otherwise. And that would be an evaluation of your entire system or at least the parts of your system that they can easily see, where they take a look at it, and make some recommendations and corrections. Want to make sure things are complete, they're undamaged. We want to make sure that, you know, it's clean, you don't have any biological growth. Uh, I don't even want to tell you some of the things that I've seen growing in ducts, living in ducts, downstream of filter banks. And you want to test for leaks around the seams. And this is particularly true in, in older systems and older buildings or older facilities where you're going to see some of the flexible bellows start to crack and break. Um, there's all sorts of leakage and maybe red green needs to come and visit with his duct tape and do a little bit of fixing handyman secret weapon and I'm not trying to make fun of it but there's things that you can do there really I think for the purposes of today's call it comes down to your filtration system inspection and this is really a complex inspection and this is where I'm going to perhaps blow Simcoe's horn to a certain extent. And that's best performed by a trained Simcoe HVAC professional. And in that case, that could potentially be someone like me. I am a certified air filtration specialist. I am a NAFA certified technician. I have 10 years of industry background and training. And you're going to look at things like, what does your system do? Are you bringing in 100% outside air? Do you have return air? What's going on in your space? How's it, how is it occupied? What's being served? Do we have some information or we can get some information on the manufacturer's takes? CFM, feet per minute. What do the coils look like? What does the drain pan look like? Capture data on your filters. Summer tracks, winter tracks, final filter tracks, return air tracks. Are there spacers in play? Are they missing? Is the air intake located right next to the kitchen exhaust fan? Is the air intake located next to a loading dock? Do you have return air? What's your system like? The latch is in good shape? The gasket in good shape? Are there spacers there? Most importantly, do you have copies of maintenance records? Do you know what your people have been doing? Do you know what's been going on in your building? Is there an understanding? If they're writing it on the filters, that's a great thing. 
but you can't go back and look at that because they throw them away when they change them. So are they keeping records? We make some notes in the unit. We'll definitely want to talk to your occupants. We want to find about comments, concerns, safety challenges. Want to know all sorts of things. What your run times are. Do you monitor? Do you have any special operating conditions? Do people in the facility have concerns? Has a conversation been had? And you put that all together and you make some notes and you make some recommendations. In the next slide, these are all my personal pictures. These are the things that I've seen over the years out in the field. Your top left, that's that nice little wall mount office air conditioner. Look at that coil. You've got a drain plug with black mold living on the floor. Somebody's bought what they felt was a high-end final filter that's blowing apart. They haven't bought a good quality filter or they've left it too long. Uh, somebody, I don't know, they've just kind of tried to cram something in there. I've got a picture that shows pleat direction. There's a right way and a wrong way. Invariably, I see coils become filters. And people just say, you know, it's getting dirty. And then all of a sudden, the system seems to be running better and the gauges have dropped and nobody bothers to inspect. And you see a filter that's completely and totally blown out. And I've got hundreds and hundreds of these pictures. And the reality is a lot of this could have been prevented through some training or a lot of this could have been basically been prevented by having somebody manage the program for you. So when we look at maintenance and we look at PM, it's all about system integrity. When you're thinking of COVID as being an airborne disease, you want to have a really good system with great integrity. And it all comes down to little value is achieved in installing or improving a filter if your system doesn't have good integrity. So you can go out there and you can spend $1,000 on the best filter in the world, but if you don't have a system that's buttoned up, it's done nothing for you. So you've really got to take the data. You've got to start eliminating air bypass. You've got to seal your system up. You've got to make sure belts are being replaced on a regular basis. You've got to repair your malfunctioning controls. You've got to look at monitoring devices. Have you got a checklist pro protocol? Do you schedule? Do you monitor? How do you work? How do you do your maintenance? And as you start to look at COVID, perhaps this is something that you don't want to do in-house anymore. Maybe you need to look at a service provider. And this really can't stress the importance enough of PPE, personal product, protective equipment and safety. Do you have minimal requirements? When I first started traveling, one of the first facilities I went into was in Lalash, Saskatchewan to the hospital. And I don't know if any of you know a lot about Northern Saskatchewan, but they're really fighting on a regular outbreak uh, basis, tuberculosis. It, it's a reality, it's a concern. There's dedicated rooms, there's de dedicated spaces. So I'm working with the, the maintenance guys and they said, do you have HEPA filters? And I said, yeah, I do have HEPA filters. He said, great, I wanna, wanna find out if you've got this one. So off he went and he came back and he's holding this HEPA filter out and he's trying to get me to take it from him. And he said, do you have one like this? And I, knowing what I did at that time, which was minimal, I knew enough to put my arms behind my back and take a step back. I said, maybe. I said, where did that come from? He said, oh, this comes from our TB isolation room and we're putting all our exhaust air through it. So the TB is still viable in there. It, it's still living in there. And he's holding this thing, and TB like COVID's airborne, and he's holding this thing without a mask. He doesn't, he's not protecting his eyes. He's got short sleeved shirt on. He's got cuts in his arms. So, you know, it, it just drives home the point. What do you have in play? What are your requirements for PPE? So it's not only about COVID, it's about the other stuff as well. 
COVID's just brought it to the forefront. Do you have lockout tagouts? Do you have safe work procedures? Have you ever done a hazard assessment? COVID has really changed our world and it's really changed the way we work. And, and it's just becoming more and more apparent every day. So here's the reality. We've got large complex facilities potentially on this call. We also got small town facilities on this call, which may have a forest air furnace and that's it. And I understand that. And you all need to understand that there's some limitations there and you can't have unreasonable expectations. You can have any expectations in the world that you want as long as you're willing to pay for them, but have reasonable expectations about what you can do. The equipment that you have, the equipment in use is going to dictate what you can and cannot do. If you have household furnaces, force flow units or heat pumps, you may have to forget about MERV 13. That may have to be a different conversation. All these units have design limitations. You need to have this information before you make an, an upgrade. Consult somebody like a CAFS or an NCT or, or another highly trained industry professional. And remember, you can't just throw a HEPA filter in there and walk away. So at the start of the presentation today, I asked everybody to write down your color blue. And I'm going to ask you right now, you can chime in if you'd like, uh, what were some of the answers that were out there when you think of blue? I said the sky. Okay. I said blueberry, Scott. Okay. Uh, I said water or diamonds, blue diamonds. <laughs> hey, there's somebody there. <laughs> I said water, but uh, yeah, <laughs> water and diamonds. That's yeah. what we want here. <laughs> well, this is what came to mind for me. Those beautiful blue fields of flax that are out there right now. Even in the drought, there's still a little bit of blue out there. And I do this because it just, it's, I like to call it a perception check. And why is this important? Visually, when would you change the filter? Well, number one's clean. Number two is definitely dirty. Number three is really gross. You want to put on a hazmat suit before you deal with that puppy. And the reality of what I found over the years is a lot of places and a lot of facilities and a lot of people just basically change it number two because it's starting to get dirty. And for those of you that understand your program or for those of you that are using a service provider that really knows what they're doing and are investing in a good quality product, you can get towards number three. And the closer you get to number three, the better job the filter's doing and the better job it's doing of protecting your environment. So number one might be the water, number two might be, blue, be that blue diamond, and number three might be that sky. And this is why I always say, when you have somebody visually looking at something, they'll hold it up to the light, they're gonna do this, they're gonna do that. But as we're dealing with COVID and how dangerous it can be, you may wanna step back and look at a magnahelic gauge, you wanna may step back and look at utilizing your BMS system, you wanna, maybe move away from that visual check because it's about protecting us and our people and everybody going home safe. So as I start to wind this down, what are some of the potential next steps? Well, for those of you in the call, these are some of the things that you may want to go back and do. Determine your facility's use and what your level of concern is. Maybe you're only going to have minor hockey. Maybe the kids are all going to come pre-dressed. They're going to have their skates on or they're going to put their skates on in their stand and they're not going to share a room. Others may very simply go all out and let everybody come in. 
Some of you may be having multiplexes. You only know what your usage is, and that's going to dictate your level of concern. Have you had a realistic look at your equipment in the areas served? Do you know if you have return air? If you do, how is it utilized? Return air is your COVID concern. What kind of training do your people have? And you know what? At the end of the day, nobody wants to belittle what anybody does. But the reality is, are they trained and are they competent? There's a right way and a wrong way to install. There's a right way and a wrong way to, ma to manage, maintain, and look after these things. Has your facility ever been audited or surveyed? Have a realistic look at your budget. Know if you've got dollars to spend and look at the best way to spend them. Do you have or have you had a trained and qualified industry professional potentially take over the service of your air handling units? And in a case like ours, hey, we can look after your rinks. We'd love to look after your refrigeration. We can also look after the service of your units. And there's also things in the industry with NAFA, which is the North American Filtration Association, where your building can be certified clean or have clean air certification. And there's currently 18 buildings in the province of Saskatchewan that carry that. And I put all 18 of those buildings through over the past three or four years. So that's a conversation you may or you may not want to have with us. Last but not least, th this is a giant topic, and this is done in a short amount of time. You may want to reach out and you may want to have further discussion. And there are my contact details. Okay, so Scott, I guess we've wrapped up your formal presentation. Absolutely. Extremely well done. Thank you very much for providing us with sort of that range of what our facilities can look at. Okay, everything from the larger centers to the smaller community rinks. Does anybody have any questions at this particular point in time for Scott? Or just some general observations to share? Because again, from my perspective, I thought this was a terribly important topic because of the way COVID uh, can be spread, especially in the confines of our recreation spaces. So any thoughts from anybody? Um, it was interesting when you guys talked about air scrubbers, Tim. I actually didn't even know that that was a thing until uh, when you know, today. He does all of our first aid certifications, but he was actually CEO of the WACA healthcare facility this year, the center that got a massive COVID outbreak. Um, and he brought in industrial air scrubbers actually to clean the air. I did a lot of work with Steve Old on that actually. Prior to joining, joining Simcoe, the uh, SASC Health Authority used me extensively for uh, consulting on those things. Yeah, and he said, you know what, like the air scrubbers worked amazingly well, but by the time they figured out that that was the issue and got them there, COVID had spread so rapidly. Um, but I didn't even know air scrubbers were a thing or like who would you even get a hold of? <laughs> it was kind well, of you're, you're talking to the guy that the health region came to. <laughs> oh, good. Good. good for that contact information. And then um, Len said he was looking into the portable kind of air cleaners, or whatever, for dressing rooms in our arena, especially. Um, just with hockey season, it's going to be in full swing. Something good to look at those portable ones. But Tim, to the best of your knowledge, there's no phone yet available for this kind of stream, hey? Sorry, what was that? There's no funding yet available that you know of, hey, for this kind of costs no, not at this particular point shannon but you know my personal thought is because of covid indoor air quality is becoming more of a priority so yeah. it wouldn't surprise me that in the future there'll be funds made available from upper tier governments to help communities address this that's my thought i'm not sure if scott's got anything further that he could add or any other communities but that's where I would put some of my money down is that there's going to be future funding for this. So whatever, I guess, work you can do now 
prepare for that possible funding announcement, it's probably not a bad investment is where I would where I would go. Okay, awesome. Thank you. It was a good presentation. Thank you. I just um, I no, I, I just actually did this presentation for or a similar presentation for Orfa about three or four weeks ago and it was the same thing. You know, they're looking at future funding and they're trying to get their so called ducks in the row right now on that. So So Scott, maybe can you give a quick explanation what a air scrubber is? Yeah, there's different air scrubbers on the market. There's there's an air what we think of as an air scrubber or an air cleaner. The, the air scrubbers tend to be small boxes or two foot by two foot boxes with stack filters in there that will move air through at different velocities. They'll typically have a, a HEPA filter. Uh, the room air cleaners are a little bit more sophisticated device in that you can add carbon for odor and you can add UV for ultra. Uh, ultraviolet light control as well as HEPA filtration and they're easily moved they have a tendency to be a little bit more attractive a little bit larger um, for a, a different variety of conditions so they're essentially do very much the same thing there's some are a little bit more utilitarian and others are are, are larger and more functional Thank you, Scott. Um, in the chat, someone from the SPRA office has put in a link to Canada's Community Revitalization Fund. So you may want to check out that as a possible port source for funding. Okay, I'm not sure who that is other than Saskatchewan Parks and Recreation. Okay, but thanks for that. Um, several times, Scott, you mentioned throughout your presentation that HEPA filter isn't the single solution. Could you sort of explain why a HEPA filter isn't that best single solution? A little bit more detail, because HEPA, everybody thinks, well, everything's HEPA. You can buy vacuum cleaners that are HEPA. Yeah, you know, I think the easiest way that I can describe this to everybody on the call is if you think of a, a sheet of plywood, a four by eight sheet of plywood, and if you took that sheet of plywood and you uh, methodically drilled holes in it the size of a baseball, that may become a Merv 8 filter and you'd be able to walk into the wind. Uh, you'd have some work involved walking into the wind with that sheet of plywood, but you'd be able to do it. And if you move to a Merv 13 filter, that may be the same sheet of plywood with a bunch of holes, perhaps the size of a small marble. You can still walk into the wind. You may need a little bit of help and there's a lot more resistance to airflow. It's, it's, it's blocking a lot more of the wind. If you take that same four by eight sheet of plywood and a couple of finishing nails, knock some holes in it, try walking into the wind. It's probably going to become a, a sail. HEPA filters by nature of design stop a lot of small particles and they have a lot of resistance to airflow. And one of the reasons they're so bloody expensive is because a 24 by 24 by 2 pleated filter may have 14 square feet of media in it. A 24 by 24 by 12 HEPA filter could have 250 to 500 square feet of media in it. And you need a lot of media and you need a lot, it's specially designed. And you also need a specially designed system to overcome the resistance to airflow. And it needs to be positive sealed and you know, there's just all kinds of criteria. You just, I often think of air filtration and uh, resistance to airflow. I'm sure everybody in the call is going to get this one. Have you ever tried to get a 14 year old out of bed on a Saturday morning at eight o'clock to cut the grass? It just doesn't work. And air is, is like that, uh, an air filters and air, it's like kind of like that 14 year old. They're going to take the path of least resistance. And that's what air does in your system is take the path of least resistance. And if you try and put a HEPA filter, it's going to blow your system up in most cases. Um, just wanted to mention a couple of things. One is that SPRE person that shared that link, that's Dan Gallagher. And he's also said here as an FYI, SUMA is having a webinar tomorrow at 10 a.m. about the Canada Community Revitalization Fund. So if 
anybody would like to find out more information, go to the SUMO website for that. Okay. Is there any more questions? I know I have a few more for Scott, but I don't want to dominate the conversation. Does anybody else have anything specific, specifically related to their facility that they want to ask Scott? Don't be shy. No, nobody out there that has a question for Scott? I don't think I did that good of a job. Maybe you did too good of a job. I, I doubt it. <laughs> it's a big topic. It's, it's a lot to wrap your head around. Scott, as far as changing filters are concerned, have you seen any type of seasonal impact? You know, for example, harvest and the amount of dust in the air, that kind of thing? Yeah, you know, that's one of the most common things you'll see out there is people say we change them quarterly or we change them every three months or we hire our uh, maintenance people or our maintenance program on, on every three months so we change four times a year. And the reality is maybe you do change four, maybe you do change five times a year, but you do it once in the winter and three or four times in the summer. Um, dirt load is controlled by Mother Nature from the outside and facility usage from the inside, and that's not consistent. Okay, thanks for that, Scott. So, Scott, if, I have, uh, if I'm operating a small community rink, and I have, let's say, four to five dressing rooms, and maybe all I have in my dressing room right now is an exhaust fan that's located over by the shower facility washroom area. Okay, how can I, how can I improve my air quality in that space? What would you recommend that I do? Well, the reality of it is, is, is you likely don't have the budget, the ability to bring air into the room through your HVAC system, uh, so you. Two good options would be potentially adding a room air cleaner with UV or potentially putting in a roof line or an upper air UV system maybe of use there as well. Okay. And aside from your company and speaking with you directly, what who would I reach out to? That's kind of a tough one. Um, the folks that have taken over in the company that I left don't have the training or background because they're new. And I just... That's fine. I don't want to put you yeah, on the spot. Yeah, and a lot, of, a lot of people in the industry used to come to me. I mean, I, I just... I, I took a lot of calls from a lot of different places over the years, so... Well, maybe a first good step is to reach out to you. Yeah. Okay. And if you have a larger facility, maybe that has a more complicated air handling system, sort of the same thing, would you recommend reach out to you or some other source? Yeah, I'm happy to talk. I'm happy to talk to anybody here. Um, conversations don't have to be lengthy and, and they're certainly not going to cost anybody other than a bit of time. And you never know, we might become friends. <laughs> And I love to love to have the conversation, and I'll help where I can, or direct. Yeah. I know for some of the, the season that's upcoming, you know, we can use Mother Nature to our advantage as far as leaving, you know, some facility doors open and perhaps some windows if we have that, you know, but I guess that's not going to work well when it's a minus 40 degree day in January, perhaps. Not at all. Except for the natural ice rinks. Yes, true. That's a good point. Does anybody else have any questions for Scott? That was a really good presentation, you guys. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Okay, well, if we don't hear any, have any more questions for those that are on the call today, maybe we'll wrap this up shortly. Okay, um, I would just like to thank Scott and his colleagues from Simcoe Refrigeration for putting on today's
presentation. You have Scott's contact information. So if you do have questions specific to your facility, please take a minute, reach out to Scott and maybe explore what options are available. Again, from my position as 30 plus years in the recreation business, you know, I do have a concern about the ventilation in our arena facilities because often they were built much like a refrigerator, refrigerator where we try to carefully manage our airflow in order to keep our facility cold enough for maintain a good ice. So, you know, what we're suggesting is when you add more ventilation, more fresh air, you're also impacting not only your costs, but the, the environment within your building. Okay. Scott, before we wrap up, can you just briefly, sh I guess, explain to me what the clean air certification would involve in case somebody wanted to move in that direction? Is it a very complicated and complex costly process or? It is a somewhat of a complex process. The clean air uh, award is, uh, available through NAFA, which is the North American Filtration Association. Um, it's an industry award. Uh, I, I can provide information to anybody that's interested in talking about it uh, around how your facility is maintained, improvements that are made, what qualifications the people looking after your facility possess or have. Um, and it's, it's a point system. It's a checklist point system that you have to go through and uh, then a nomination needs to be made and it needs to be done by a NAFA member company by a certified air filtration specialist. So you got to find one of those rare beasts out there in the province. Um, shortly after I started with Simcoe, we joined NAFA. So we are investigating doing this for some of the clients that we are currently servicing and putting in the enhanced training and things in-house ourselves so that we can work with our facilities and nominate. For anybody on this call who may have a few questions and you want to talk to somebody besides me, chat with Neil Hamilton with the City of PA. I put three of Neil's buildings through for this in my prior life. We were looking at doing the Art Hauser Center this year, but I went and changed jobs on them. So I'm not sure if he's talking to me right now yet or not. Okay. So Neil would be a good reference then. Neil, Neil would be a good reference for, yeah, if, if he'll answer the phone, because he's, he's a bit of a tough one to get on the phone, but uh, Neil might yeah. be a good reference on that. Okay. Some of us on the call may be familiar with, with Neil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think everybody's familiar with Neil. Once you've met him, you don't forget him. Okay. So again, I'd like to thank everybody on the call today. I really appreciate your participation and again uh, look out keep an eye out for that follow-up email that will have a link to the recording and also the evaluation and again if you can take two minutes and complete the evaluation I greatly appreciate your input okay and again thanks Scott and I think one of the things that sort of rings in my mind is your comment that where you said the solution to pollution is dilution so that's one of them yeah okay oh do you have more no, no, that's 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 a good one. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. So thanks everybody for participating today. Uh, take care. Have a safe rest of summer, and look forward to your facilities being back to normal or near normal come this fall. So thank you. Thanks.